Welcome to the Dr. Lori Morris podcast, where she interviews experts in health and science, sharing their expertise so you can live your healthiest life. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by Fit Vegan Coaching, the world's leading whole food plant-based body recomposition program for Gen X and baby boomers. Founded by Maxime, whose personal journey began after losing his ex fiance to breast cancer, Fit Vegan Coaching is on a mission to disease-proof the world through the transformative power of plant-based eating and fitness. This program is a Rolls Royce of plant-based coaching, offering all-inclusive services, personalized plans, world-class accountability, lifelong support, and more. Say goodbye to the yo-yo dieting and embrace a lasting transformation that will rev up your metabolism even post-transformation. Ready to take charge of your health and vitality? Head over to fitvegan.ca, that's fitvegan.ca, and mention Dr. Lori for exclusive bonus savings when you sign up. Don't miss this opportunity to join the movement towards a healthier, fitter, and more vibrant you. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by The Healing Kitchen, your path to vibrant health. Immerse yourself in the transformative program, guided by the combined expertise of myself, Dr. Lori Marbus, and Chef Brittany Giroudi, who has lost 70 pounds on a whole food plant-based diet. Here's what's in store for you. Virtual weekly sessions. Engage in an immersive 60-minute virtual session every single week, where you'll delve into the world of wholesome plant-based goodness right from your own kitchen. Cooking with Brittany the first half hour. Unleash your inner chef as you're captivated by Chef Brittany Giroudi's culinary mastery that will delight your taste buds and nourish your body. Medical Q&A with Dr. Lori the last half hour. Prioritize your well-being during the second half hour. I will personally address your medical inquiries, providing evidence-based insights and personalized advice, empowering you to make informed choices for your health. So join us on the Healing Kitchen to help you step into a healthier and most vibrant future. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus. And today I'm very, very excited where we dive deep into a kind of a transformative health, world of health and mindfulness. And today we're incredibly honored to have a true pioneer in the field with us, Dr. Ellen Langer. Dr. Langer is a renowned psychologist and often referred to as the mother of mindfulness. And she's a professor at Harvard University and the author of the book, The Mindful Body, which really started my journey to try to reach her. And thank you, Dr. Langer, for joining us today. Now, my pleasure. I'm happy uh, to be here. Well, I'm beyond tickled, as most people say. <laughs> you know, I get excited about really interviewing people who can inspire you know, it's kind others. kind of interesting, Lori. I mean, the expression yeah. beyond tickled, you know, what <laughs> does that actually mean? You know, I don't know. Because There's... you would think that after you were tickled, you'd be done, right? No. <laughs> but we're I just don't... beginning. I think it's the next level. Uh, no, yeah, it's like a... <laughs> You know, it's like, I think when I was younger, I also said like Jiminy Crickets, like I, I kind of create these unique things that just kind of catch people off guard and they stop listening to me like, wait a minute, I'm trying to understand what you just said. Oh my goodness. Yes, absolutely. But well, let's get to your book, but Dr. Langer, your book, The Mindful Body really presents some groundbreaking ideas. Could you kind of share what inspired you to kind of explore the connection between mindfulness and physical health? Yeah, sure. Well, the first thing is people need to understand what I mean by mindfulness, because this has nothing to do with meditation, which is fine. It's just very different. Meditation is a practice you engage in to result in post-meditative mindfulness. Mindfulness, as we study it, is immediate. It's not a practice. It's a way of being. And um, essentially, you know, this is sort of remarkable, uh, Laurie, if, you, if your listeners uh, don't have any idea about any of this, it's not going to sound believable at first, uh, because all you need to do is notice. You notice new things, the neurons start firing, and 40 years of research shows that it's literally and figuratively enlivening. So 40 years is a long time, so I've had an opportunity to do a lot of studies where we make people mindful, give them this chance to actively notice. They live longer, they're happier, they're healthier, they're more charismatic, their relationships improve, virtually everything. And you know, so when people ask, well, so what should I do? Um, all you really need to do is 
I mean, let's say you go out your front door and notice three new things. When you come home and if you're living with somebody, notice three new things about them. And you just keep doing this. And what happens is you come to see the things you thought you knew, you didn't know very well at all, which you can't because everything is always changing. Everything looks different from different perspectives. And so when we think we know, we're probably more often than not being mindless. Um, you know, I'm, so while mindfulness is active noticing, mindlessness, we're really like robots where we think we know. In fact, I, I think the easiest way to understand it is that you're frequently in error, but rarely in doubt. And that's the way we're all taught by parents, by teachers. So, you know, I often start these talks and I'll ask somebody. So I'll ask you, Laurie, although uh -oh. so how much is one plus one? Well, I read your book. And okay, it, so you it, know the answer. But I before know the you answer. read it, before, before I read, read it, I would have put two, and I right. and but That's now right. okay. I think differently about everything because of this book. <laughs> okay, so you know this is the thing that everybody is most certain of, and it turns out one plus one isn't always two. If you add one wad of chewing gum plus one wad of chewing gum, one plus one is one. You add one pile of laundry plus one pile of laundry, one, and it goes on and on. In the real world, it probably doesn't equal two, as um, or more often as does. Now, you know, so if somebody, if you just learned this from me, and then a few minutes later, somebody said to you, then hopefully it would be true even if a month later, somebody said to you, how much is one plus one? You wouldn't mindlessly blurt out two. You'd pay some attention to the context, and then you, you'd answer more conditionally. It could be two. And that's the world we, we should be living in, a world of possibility. It could be this, but often not. And um, so the original question you asked me, which is how did I get into all of this? And um, I, I, the book that you mentioned, my new book, The Mindful Body started off as a memoir. And there are lots of very personal stories there. And one, which was probably the first instance um, experience I had of mind-body unity, but I was very young, so I wasn't thinking in those terms, but it's kind of fun. So I was secretly married, don't tell anybody, when I was very young. Okay. And, and at 18 or maybe 19, we went to Paris on our honeymoon. And so now I was, you know, say 19 going on 40. I was very sophisticated. We go out to eat and on the menu is um, a mixed grill, which I get. And on the plate is pancreas. So I asked my then husband, which of these things is the pancreas? He points to it and you know, I'm going to eat it because after all, now I'm a married woman. Uh, I eat everything else. Now comes the moment of truth where I try to eat the pancreas and I literally, quite literally get sick. In the meantime, he starts laughing. And I say, why are you laughing? He said, because that's chicken. You ate the pancreas a while ago. All right, so clearly I made myself sick. Um, this, the second story that's probably more important to my life's work was uh, my mother had um, breast cancer that had metastasized to her pancreas. As you know better than I probably, that that's the end game. And then magically it was gone. And the medical world couldn't explain it. And this theory that I've developed and have worked on for you know, 45 years uh, can't explain it. So the idea is uh, to realize that mind and body, um, uh, if, if you have a mind and body, then you have to worry about how do you get from the mind to the body? But everybody knows, you know, I mean, you see somebody regurgitate and you yourself feel sick, you know, so we know there's a relationship and people now um, talk about mind body connection. I'm not talking about connection because if they're connected, you still have to figure out how you get from one to the other. I'm suggesting these are just words. Let's put the mind and body back together. And then wherever we're putting one, we're necessarily putting the other. And that, um, you know, so then this book, The Mindful Body, has many, many experiments uh, dealing, describing, providing evidence for the notion of mind body unity. People uh. 
So, um, you know, you mentioned that many people in the audience are physicians, and um, I don't know how old they are, but way back, not that long ago, the medical model uh, suggested that what one thinks and feels is totally irrelevant. The only way you're going to get sick is the introduction of an antigen. And now things have advanced. You have mind-body connection, and I've just told you the problem with that. Mm -hmm. And eventually, hopefully, with people like you and talks like this, we'll move faster to the realization that it's one thing. If mm -hmm. it's one thing, the amount of control we have over our health and well being becomes enormous, uh, not a small change. Mm -hmm. And so it's very exciting um, because the, the studies just keep turning out these results that um, um, are big you know the, the first one of these i may give you a chance to talk in a moment but i'm on a roll <laughs> you keep so, going, please. <laughs> the first one of these was the counterclockwise study oh. and, and people may know about that study because i'm told that uh there's an episode the simpsons go to havana where they actually describe what they see as the study and, and it's <laughs> uh, but anyway we did this quite a while ago where we uh retrofitted a retreat so that it would appear to be 20 years earlier. And we had elderly men live there as if they were their younger selves. So they spoke about the um, past events as if they were just unfolding. And in a period as short as a week, we found their vision improved, their hearing improved, their strength, their memory, and they looked noticeably younger, all without any medical intervention. So that was quite a while ago. And I'll give you a chance to ask me uh, if you want <laughs> any of the new studies. There was, there's so many questions. <laughs> Going back to the, the, so you said you were married. I'm just curious, was that the, <laughs> But just for a divorce, because I would have been very upset if no, no. certainly <laughs> laughing about the pancreas personally. <laughs> <clears throat> that, that might have been sown the seeds. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness. But I was really um there, there's such an amazing thing. So you've been self-reflecting for a long period of time. So that's a really interesting thing that you have this natural capacity and to just continue question the curiosity, I think, which my friend, Dr. Jeb Brewer, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but, you know, he says curiosity is your superpower. And I really think that's really a key component well, here. But let me tell you, there's a difference between mindfulness and curiosity. Right. So that the, the difference is at the very beginning, they're the same. You want to know, you know, you don't know, and you're eager to find out. The difference is if you're curious, usually then there's an answer and then you're no longer curious. Yeah. When you're mindful, you never stop because you know, as I said before, everything is changing. And so what was true before, you know, now may no longer be true. Yeah. So it makes everything new and everything potentially exciting. Now, you know, what, what scares people, because essentially we don't know, right? You don't know anything. Um, and um, people know they don't know but they don't know that they shouldn't know, that they can't know. So we pretend, you know, and we give over some power to people who pretend that they do know. I was at a horse event many years ago. It changed my life. This man came over and asked me if I give, um, watch his horse because he was going to get his horse a hot dog. Well, I'm Harvard, Yale all the way through. I mean, horses don't need me. It's ridiculous, right? But, you know, I say, sure, I'll watch the horse. He came back with the hot dog and the horse ate it. And that's when I realized that everything I thought I knew could be wrong. And what people need to understand is that all of the facts we have are really conditional context dependent statements. When you do a study, what you find is those results are probably true. Then newspapers, teachers, you know, books report those as absolutes. And so when you know something is absolute, then you don't pay any attention to it any longer. When you know it's a maybe, then, you know, so if you're given a dread diagnosis and you assume that this is true, you're going to behave one way. When you know that it's based on probabilities, then you very well may behave differently. Mm. And that, that notion guides a lot of my work. Mm. So the one constant is change. Right. If we can accept that, we'll become 
I guess, less stress. So I, I guess right. intuitively as a human, we get very stressed about not seeing some type of concrete, absolute, something that we can rely well, stress, on. Stress itself is mindless. Mm. You know, when you're stressed, you're, you're assuming something is going to happen. And when it happens, it's going to be awful. Mm. And both of those are wrong. Um, you, we cannot predict. Prediction is an illusion. And, and people find a lot of difficulty with this. I spend time in the book. Um, I'll just briefly you know, try to make clear now. We're very good at posticking after the fact, making it all make sense. So we assume we could predict. So let's say you're at a party and you see John and Jane fighting. And if I said to you then, are they gonna get divorced? You'd say, yeah, well, why are they gonna get divorced? People fight, right? But let's say we didn't have that conversation. You're at the party and you see John and Jane, whoever I just said, fighting. And then two weeks later, you find out they're getting the divorce. Ah, I knew it. You should have seen the way they went at each other. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I used to teach this graduate class in decision making. And I asked the students, I said, okay, look, um, I've been teaching a version of this class for maybe 40 years. I've never missed a class. What is the likelihood I'm going to be here next week? And they go around the room. I go around the room to get each of them to give me an answer. These are Harvard students. So they're smart, but bizarre. They say things like 97%. I mean, they know it's not supposed to be 100%, but you can't do a calculation you know, to come up with 90%. So they all give me this kind of, essentially, they all say, I will be there. Now I say to them, let's go around the room again. And I want each of you to give me a good reason why I won't be there here. And the first person always says, well, you've always been here, you deserve the time off. The next person says your dog has to go to the vet. The next person says you got a flat tire. And we get now 12, 15 good reasons. Now I say, okay, let's go around the room again. What is the likelihood I'm going to be here next week? And the 100% drops to 50%. Uh... And I don't remember where I was headed with all of that, but now, you, oh yes, about stress. stress so yeah. when you're stressed, you're making a prediction. So yeah. if you simply said to yourself, what are three, five reasons why this thing you know, may not happen? You're going to immediately feel better. But yeah. the other part of that, let's assume it does happen. How is that a good thing? If people don't understand that events don't cause stress. What causes stress are the views you take of events. So if you open it up and take a more mindful view, um, the stress is, is more than likely going to dissipate because those things that seem, oh my gosh, you know, wow, that's not a bad thing at all. And if we went and reviewed some of the things that we were stressed about, we'd probably find two things. One, most of them never happen. I mean, Mark Twain said that first. The second is that they turned out to be good things mm. rather than the things we were worried about. So, and I think it's very, very important for people to recognize that stress is a result of mindlessness and mindlessness can be prevented because I personally, I don't have uh, data for this, believe that stress is the major killer that if you took people who were just diagnosed and nobody who gets some dread diagnosis is going to be happy but so let's give them a few weeks to calm down and figure out how to deal with it and then we tapped in every month uh, to their level of stress i think that would predict the course of the disease over and above treatment nutrition genetics um, and everything else so it's a big statement but i think even the medical world today uh, will agree that stress is uh, harmful. And I'm just suggesting yeah. that it's more harmful than, um, than people imagine. I think so, because I, I think, you know, when you're describing mind-body connections, I'm, I'm really- Mind-body unity. Gonna be, yeah, mind-body unity. I almost want to have one word <laughs> for <Yeah>. mind-body <laughs> and leave out yeah. the, uh, the connector word here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe a Moby or something. I don't know. Uh, but my, it's a really interesting thing. So I run, um, I have a lot of diabetics in my practice. I'm a family medicine physician by training, but I really focus in on lifestyle medicine and healthy interventions. And I really want them to understand the stress component. So I will run a group where I provide, um, I'm tapping my hand here because of, 
I provide continuous glucose monitors. So these are monitoring blood sugar 24 seven. And I like to experiment with myself and share that data. So getting to the stress piece of it, I watched, um, we don't typically watch television, but I love World War II history. And I'd watched some a documentary on that and kind of went down the rabbit hole of some things hadn't eaten in three hours. So you'd think my blood sugar would be like it normally is under 80 or so when I go to bed, went to bed at nine. However, I woke up at midnight. I'm a very vivid dreamer. Uh, it was an intense World War II uh, dream. dream. <laughs> and I looked at my blood sugar. It had steadily risen to 120. Wow. It's never happened before. And I've worn these things for many, many months. And it dropped precipitously after I woke up. So it really makes sense to me yeah. that we don't even begin well, to understand what's happening. And I was like astounded, but I'll see the same thing with patients when they have a stressful event, their blood sugars or insulin resistance stays elevated yeah. for a longer period of time. This is just, And this is just one data point, obviously, but I mean, it's really a fascinating thing to yeah, think well, about. So one, of the, one of the studies that we did on mind-body unity was about diabetes. So we have people who have type 2 diabetes come into the lab. We give them you know, all sorts of tests. And then we set them down by a computer, and the setup will be clear in a moment. Next to the computer is a clock. Now, so we tell everybody, we want you to play computer games and then switch the game you're playing approximately every 15 minutes. That's to ensure that they'll look at the clock. The clock is rigged, but they don't know it. So for a third of the people, it's going twice as fast as real time. For a third of the people, it's going half as fast as real time. And for a third of the people, it's real time. The question we're asking is, will blood sugar level follow perceived time, the time the clock tells them, or real time? And it turns out it follows clock time, hmm. perceived time. Hmm. You know, again, suggesting that, um, you know, so for you, you had a dream, you weren't in control, and your blood sugar, you know, is re uh, rising precipitously and, you know, what have you. Here, when you're wide awake, um, you have the same control over yeah. your blood sugar. Yeah, well, that is interesting. I've, well, I've seen all sorts of things happen with things, but I had a patient or a friend who had a patient. He was a, he's an endocrinologist, and she always said that speaking about one particular family member would raise her blood sugars really high. So he came, she came into his office one day and said, hey, how are you doing? He checked her blood sugar. It was like 120 he started instigating this conversation regarding this family member. And within 15 minutes, her blood sugars rose to 300. Wow. And she hadn't eaten. And it just really speaks. I mean, 300 is actually <laughs> it's, like, it's like, where's the insulin? Um, but, you know, that's the kind of thing that's happening. So when we are looking at ourselves and what we can do on a day-to-day -day basis, how do we build this practice of mindfulness so it will have this positive impact. On well, it's not a practice. You okay. know, so what we need to do is one of two things. Now, if you can accept that we don't know, that uncertainty is the rule, not the exception, then you tune into everything because you don't know, mm -hmm. uh, right? And then everything becomes interesting. And as you pain, these, um, you know, noticing new things, again, the neurons are firing and um, it's the essence of being engaged. It's easy and it's fun. However, we have been taught so many things that we think we know, the way that one plus one is two, horses don't eat meat, and so on, that the other way is, you know, just as a rule, start to notice five new things, three new things with everything that you're doing. Um, and, you know, and sometimes that's hard for people too, so that at the least, when you're feeling bad, you know, because then all of a sudden you, you're paying attention to the world, um, start to ask yourself, how can it be otherwise? How might this be a good thing? Um, you know, if, if you're doing something, do it differently. You know, and you put your right shoe on first, put your left shoe on first. Now, if you keep doing that after a while, that will become automatic and mindless too. So that's not enough. Um, but my feeling is that, if you're willing to do something, you should show up for it. Whether it's brushing your teeth, unpacking, you know, uh, the groceries, 
no matter what. And, um, and there's a great advantage to doing it. You know, um, so what we've been taught, you know, how not to pay attention to these things here, so we can attend to those things over there. And um, people need to recognize that the things that they're, they think they know, but they're not paying attention to, um, are not the same as when they were younger. You know, that if you learn something at 20, and now you're 40, and you're still doing it the same way, that's kind of sad. You know, uh, people, people say to me, isn't there a time when it's good to be mindless? Mm -hmm. And my answer to that is no, as far as I'm concerned, never, unless two conditions are met. One is you found the very best way of doing something and two circumstances don't change. And I don't think you're ever going to, you know, so then we say, okay, so you're at a park and you have a little kid and the kid starts wandering into the street. Shouldn't you just mindlessly grab them to save them? I said, no, if you were mindful, they wouldn't have wandered into the street in the first place. And second, you don't want to mindlessly grab them because you want to pay some attention to the oncoming car. And is it going to the right or the left to know which way to uh, bring the child out of harm's way? Um, and that people don't understand that being mindful is the way you are when you're having fun. So you can't be too mindful. You know, if, if you were, if somebody said, somebody says to me, well, it sounds terrible to want to be mindful all the time. I said, do you want to be happy all the time? Do you want to be having fun all the time? Sure. Well, you can't be having fun if you're not noticing new things. If you enjoy crossword puzzles, for instance, and you just finished it, doing it again where you know the answers is just not fun. Hmm. You know, um, that humor relies on being mindful. And now I, I would usually break into a joke, but I'm not going to make you Share your jokes. I love jokes. No. But the point <laughs> is that things are funny when, you know, you're expecting them to go this way and all of a sudden you realize, oh, you know, and you're hit with the punchline. And it's because it's new and surprising that it becomes fun. Mm. So, no, I think some of our favorite comedians are when they take ordinary experiences and right. interject and, these unusual spins, exactly. perspectives. And I think it was you in the book or one of your books that I've been listening to, um, the keyhole, kind of like you have a keyhole you're looking through and it's a very limited perspective. Mindfulness allows you to see a wider up. perspective. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, so that when um, when you're mindful, you, you see opportunities to which you'd otherwise be blind. You can avoid the dangers not yet arisen. There's no downside. You know, and the data over all these many decades has shown that not only are you healthier, you're happier, you know, you're alive, people you interact with uh, have a better appreciation for you, you're seen to be charismatic, authentic, um, and the products that we produce, so we have research on this as well, bear the imprint of that mindfulness. So everything is just better. And again, I go back to, if you're going to do it, do it. You know? mm -hmm. If it's not worth being there to do, then don't do it. I, I remember years ago, um, you know, there was a time young people probably don't know that everybody didn't have television sets that were the size they are now. And so we <laughs> went to the movies and there were so many people I knew that I you know, dated and whatever, where we'd go to the movie and they'd walk and all they do is complain about it. And, you know, to me, life only consists of moments. You, you don't want to waste these moments because you're, you're throwing away your life. So you either enjoy it or leave. Mm -hmm. And the fun thing is that everything can be made enjoyable. Mm -hmm. I, have you ever seen uh, the video on piano stairs? No. It's wonderful. Okay, so these people, I think it started in Scandinavia. Oh, when they ran up the stairs yeah, instead of yeah. the escalator. So, yes, right. yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, so yes. Um, uh, your listeners probably don't know, so let me explain yes. it. So if you go in many places in um, uh, subway stations around the world, you have a set of stairs and an escalator. And so they video everybody is using the escalator, except maybe on occasion, a young boy who's going to run up the stairs. Everybody's on the escalator. And then what they did was they put down a piano keys on the stairs. So as you're going up, it goes, doo, doo, it's actually making you know noise, uh, tunes. And now in a, almost no time 
it all. Everybody gets off the escalator and they start taking the stairs. Um, and, you know, so I say to my students and to anybody who listened to me, why wait for somebody to put the keyboard down? You can be doing this yourself, mm. you know, and making it fun. Mm. And uh, I think that we have some notions, I'm not sure just why, but where we want to have work and play as separate things. Mm. You know, um, it, it's as if you can't do it meaningfully if it's play, but even play should be done meaningfully, you know, uh, with a certain kind of seriousness or else that's not as much fun. Mm. And, uh, and people talk about uh, work and life. And now, oh, you know, before people, just let you work and then you go to play. Now people talk about work-life balance and that's great. It's much better than work-life imbalance. But to me, it should be work-life integration. Mm. You know, it should be essentially the same person with the same standards, you know, that you're not going to let yourself be bored, be stressed, um, be bullied, uh, whether you're at work, I mean, certainly you wouldn't at play, mm. but to be the same person and the way to uh, to become that same person is to be mindful because then you're aware of all the choices you have. Mm -hmm. It's also the case that when you're mindful, you know why you're doing the thing that you're doing. And so you don't resent not doing something else. You don't let people call you by names that are unflattering. So let me explain what I'm saying here. Mm -hmm. So it turns out Every negative description of a person, every single one, has an equally strong but oppositely valenced alternative. So I am gullible. So you could say to me, Ellen, for God's sakes, you know, please. And I look back at my behavior. Yeah, look at how gullible I am. And I try to change, but I'm not going to be able to change. The reason for that is that going forward, I'm intending to be uh, trusting. And as long as I'm trusting, I'm going to be gullible. And as long as you're uh, flexible, you're going to be inconsistent. And as long as you're serious, you're going to seem grim and so on. And so what happens in our mindless way of seeing people, we judge them negatively, we're evaluative and take people to task. Uh, when if we understood the behavior from their perspective, not from ours as observers of that behavior, we'd be in a very different place. You want me to stop being gullible, then you have to get me to stop valuing being trusting. And my guess is you wouldn't want to do that. And we'd be much more, <clears throat> we'd be kinder to each other um, and uh, happier as a group. And that would mean less stress. Mm -hmm. I have a one-liner for you, mm -hmm. since I know you're really interested in stress. Some of my friends uh, put this, so once, once they hear me say it, they write it out and they put it on the refrigerator, which is to ask yourself, is it a tragedy or an inconvenience? Mm -hmm. And almost always, it's, in, it's an inconvenience. You know, I didn't get the project done on time. I burnt the beef. I missed the bus the dog ate the homework, you know, whatever. And, um, and you know, it gives you a chance just to breathe and then just go on, mm. realize you know, it doesn't matter. Most things just don't matter. No, I, I there's so much wisdom here. Okay, so it's I'm almost it's like, a, it's like, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely fabulous. And I wish everyone had someone like you who could speak wisdom into their lives um, from childhood on. It would just be, a wonderful gift for mm -hmm. many people. So I, I do have a question for you. So in my line of work, obviously as a physician, less than what I do now, but for those who maybe deal with much more, something that might have a serious consequence. Sure. Cancer. But, yeah, exactly. Sure. How do you recommend or maybe give some advice to someone who's just gotten that diagnosis or maybe someone who's going to be giving this diagnosis how can we help frame it yeah so we can take a more mindful approach to it okay so the first thing um um we have to go back to what i said before about research mm -hmm. medical research just like all research only gives us probabilities so when you're given a diagnosis uh, what you need to know is it's a maybe, it's not an absolute. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And um, 
I mean, there are so many parts of this. I've been doing this for so long and arguing with so many, so many parts of the medical world that not so much anymore. Now we all seem to be essentially on the same page. But you know, when the physician recognizes that he or she doesn't know and communicates that, it ends up giving the patient much more power um, and control over their own lives. So that's number one. Number two is. Um, when you're given a diagnosis of, um, then you're told whatever you have is uncontrollable. You have to recognize that all that means is not that it's uncontrollable, that the medical world doesn't know how to control it. So it's indeterminate, it's very different. Now, I don't have data for this, but I think it's a thought experiment that no matter what's wrong with you, if you make the rest of you as strong as you can be, chances are you're going to fare better with whatever the ailment is. Mm. Secondly, or fourthly, whatever we're up to, um, uh, that we have, we've developed a, a system that I describe um, a treatment in the um, mindful body. It's called attention to symptom variability. Now, that's just a fancy way of saying be mindful because mindfulness is noticing change. And so we have many big diseases. We've done this with um, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, uh, depression, chronic pain, arthritis, so lots of them. And it should be true for virtually everything. That when people are given a diagnosis, they tend to assume that the symptoms are going to stay the same or get worse. But nothing stays the same and nothing moves in only one direction. There are always little blips. And so what we've done with these people is we call them periodically and we say, so how are you today? And the particular symptom that we're focused on. And is it better or worse than the last time? And why? Now, three things happen at this point. When you notice that, gee, it's not as bad, or even if you notice that it's worse, you know, there's a change. But if you notice it's not as bad at this moment, you immediately feel a little better. Second and more important, I think, is by asking the question, why is there that difference? You begin a mindful search. And that, as we've said now, mindfulness is good for your health, regardless of whether or not you find the solution. But third, I think you're more likely to find a solution if you're looking for one. Mm. And the, the good thing about this is that you can do this without anybody's help, without any intervention. Most people have a smartphone. So you set the smartphone to ring in an hour and it rings and you ask yourself, well, you know, how does my back feel now? Is it better or worse than before and why? And then set it for two hours and 10 minutes, just vary the time in the course of a day, in the course of a week, maybe two weeks. And um, you know, the, the findings, uh, those are big disorders that I mentioned. Uh -huh. um, and uh, to get a relief in symptoms, totally gone in some instances, is quite remarkable. Mm. But not so remarkable when you recognize that the strongest drug that's out there is called a placebo. Mm. And, you know, the... Um, Placebos, when, when people are told they were given a placebo, they feel fooled and, you know, but I really had the pain. Um, be, placebos have gotten a bad rap because they were used, are used primarily by pharmaceutical companies to assess the efficacy of a drug. So they're only going to make money if this drug, whatever it is, outperforms the sugar pill. Um, but the sugar pill is fabulously, you know, something inert, uh, effective. You know, you take this, uh, uh, somebody in a white coat gives you this pill, you take it, and the pill is really nothing, but you feel better. Clearly, you're making yourself feel better. And so part of my life's work has been, well, how can we give that control to people more directly? And the attention to symptom variability is, you know, what we've come up with so far. I think you mentioned in your book, you were noticing, maybe it was an interview or something that I listened to about your menopause. 
hot oh, flashes. Yeah. This is something. funny. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mark the edge of the optimism continuum. <laughs> and you know, and I never complain. I don't, you know, I don't know why, but it, it, I just don't typically. I mean, I'm not being strong. There's nothing to complain about. But I was finding that um, I was uh, breaking into a sweat and it was you know, unpleasant. And I, maybe I just needed something to say. So I was talking to somebody and I complained about this. And she said, Ellen, you know, if I said that to you, what you would say to me in return is think of it as losing weight. I said, oh, that's right. <laughs> you know? And then I never had another hot flash. I was very disappointed. <laughs> I will say I'm going through this change and I've tried this technique. I'm noticing it and saying different things. They're still coming, but not as is a rapid pace. <laughs> <laughs> but I accept it. It's changing. It will change tomorrow and the mm -hmm. next day. But no, this this is wonderful. So, well, um, I just kind of want to back up a little bit. So let's say that we are younger and maybe we have smaller children. Do you have any advice on helping our children kind of embrace this approach to mindful living, sure. with, you know, leaving mindlessness? Because I really think that'll help them deal with all the stresses and the changes that kids go through and just growing up for sure. Yeah. So I end the book with um, uh, a little song that I wrote, a little ditty, no, no big deal. I'm not going to sing it, although I should, because the please, essence, please. no, no, I'm not going to, but <laughs> you, can, you can hear it on YouTube okay. where I tell people essentially, I can, I can do many things, but I can sing, but singing is fun. Why shouldn't I sing? And then I have a hundred Harvard students singing. Everybody doesn't know something, but everybody knows something else. Everybody can can't do something, but everyone can do something else. Mm -hmm. And to make people, you know, so the child needs to know when they can't do something, it's okay, you can do something else. Mm -hmm. And that you can learn how to do whatever it is you feel that you know, that you can't do. Um, and we most importantly, I think, need to teach children to come up with multiple answers to whatever question. And that's not what we get in school. And schools should change. Mm -hmm. um, and not to be afraid of not knowing, not knowing is exciting, you know, uh, and I think, you know, I have lots in the book about um, uh, the normal distribution, which you know, um, basically we have some people who can't do it at all, most of us in the middle to make a bell-shaped curve, and a few do it really well, and I take all of that to task. Mm. And, um, you know, that uh, uh, if I were to develop a camp, which I'm doing with somebody, uh, I don't know if it'll happen, you know, I, many of these little projects, but I would have the kids go out and we would vary um, who's deciding what the rules are. So an example that I often use is I'm a, a very intermediate tennis player. And so I serve, I throw the ball up, I kill it, it doesn't go in. Then I throw it up again because I'm playing doubles, I don't want to double full. So, you know, I have a wuss second serve, it always goes in, it's easy to return. Now, if I ruled the world, we'd have three serves. One where I kill it, now I learn from that. A second one where I kill it, so I become much better, and then I still have my follow-up with third serve. And people need to realize that all of the rules, everything that exists, were just decisions to meet some people's um, needs and not serving other people's needs. So the more different whoever you are from the person who created the rule, the more important it is to recognize that that rule wasn't handed down from the heavens. Mm -hmm. And so do it your own way. And when I, when I give lectures on this, this was more years ago, when I'd be talking about the mindful learning book, I'd look in the audience. It's amazing. There's always some really tall guy there. So I'd ask him to come to the stage in a six, three, and I'm five, three. And so we look silly together, right? And then I'd ask him to put his hand up and he'd put his hand up and his hand is three, four inches larger than mine. And then I'd simply raise the question, should we do anything physical the same way? 
<laughs> no, of course not. And yet all of us are taught how to do things based on whoever it was who created the game, the rule. And so they need to hear about the ways of doing things in a more conditional, mindful way. You sort of hold the tennis racket this way. And then you find your own way of doing things. Because if you do it exactly the way the person who uh, came up with it in the first place, does it, uh, the more different you are from that person, the less well you're going to perform. And to recognize that virtually everything that is was simply once a decision. And for it to be a decision means there was uncertainty. And that means there's room uh, for change. Hmm. I see that as an innovation, right? So yes. maybe you uh, see someone who's been a coach and they come up from the ranks and they were taught the traditional way of playing a game like you were mentioning mm -hmm. but then they come a different tactic with you know maybe it's a basketball player or something for example my husband who coached our youngest son's basketball team he loved doing this right he comes from he likes to analyze things and then be creative at that point yeah. and it was really interesting to see these different types of plays that the other coaches didn't even think they about because right. the innovation piece of it. Okay, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. You know, I mean, when I did my uh, dissertation, so as you know, for any um, science paper, you're going to have an, um, an abstract, then an introduction, then a method section, a discussion section, right? I had more to say. So I had, an, you know, the abstract and introduction method, then I had the discussion, then I had a conclusion, and then I had an implication. You know? And why not? Mm -hmm. No, I think but it's great. It, it's much easier to change things when you recognize that uh, that the reason they're there as they are was just somebody deciding to put them there mm -hmm. rather than these were handed down from the heavens as the tried and true, the only way to do whatever it is we're doing. You know, people so often follow recipes that way and oh my gosh, I don't have enough sugar. All right, so add honey, add molasses or make it savory rather than sweet. Um, mm -hmm. So, no, yes, that makes complete sense. So I, a lot of, of course, what I tell and encouraging patients to do is embracing a healthier whole food plant-based diet that <laughs> anyway, but a lot of that is they're hesitant to be in the kitchen because they have been taught so many, like, yeah. here's the rules of this. So you have to do this. They're like, where do I even begin? It's like, it's difficult for them to even begin to understand how to experiment, for example, in the kitchen with recipes yeah. or no recipes. So I'm reminded of this thing. It happened many, many years ago. I was consulting. I don't remember the, the company and the CEO took me aside and said, can I help him with something? I said, sure. And he said, his daughter, uh, he doesn't know what to do. She eats more than a football player. And so, you know, so he's asking me how to help him, can, you know, help her control her, her appetite, her weight. And so I start immediately solving the problem, trying to. And then it occurred to me and I said to him, how heavy is she? And he said, she's not heavy. I said, then what's the problem? You know, so that we have rules that, um, you know, this is what's allowed. And if you do more of it, uh, then there's something wrong. If you don't do enough, it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that um, it's all, again, based on decisions rather than individual needs. W one of the things that I don't know why this example comes to mind, but, you know, I don't know how tall your husband is, but imagine how tall are you? I'm 5'7", he's 5'6". Okay, so you're tall. But mm -hmm. so let's assume that guy who came to, with me on stage at 6'3", or however tall I made him, um, and his wife is five feet tall, mm -hmm. you know, not to be off color, but they're sitting on the same toilet seat. Now, somebody's physical needs are not being met. Do you see? You know, yeah. So with, with everything that is, it's put there with certain people in mind. Mm -hmm. And if, you're, if that doesn't represent who you are, you're in trouble. Right. And we need to pay attention to that. And you add that to the fact of all the data are probabilistic. You had something with, I think it was the iWatch, um, giving people uh, feedback about their pulse or something and people and their uh, heart rate and people getting really scared because the number was, you know, was so high. So first there are technical problems. Yeah. Um, the second is how fast your pulse should be or any of these numbers 
our mm -hmm. best guesses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so when you talked before about a person whose blood sugar level rose to you know, 300, mm -hmm. um, that may be a problem, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I have uh, somebody close to me who's everything is backwards. You know, if she were to take something that was supposed to um, uh, be an up, it would put her down, you know, and <laughs> she would put on a watch and it would stop because her body chemistry was just different from other people's. And so before we um, uh, race to find, oh my gosh, why am I different? to realize that you know, many times we should just embrace the difference rather than, you know, if we recognize in a sense, I think this was a chapter heading for one of my books that none of us is us. None of us is really at the norm and um, we, we shouldn't get scared by it. Mm -hmm. And so if you go back to the medical world, this is something that has always bothered me because it combines, um, well, the conditional nature of things, probabilities, you know, and your view of stress with what medical people often tell women with breast cancer, that if the breast cancer is gone, they say you're in remission. I say you're cured. Um, you're in remission for five years. So for five years, you're dealing with stress, which is bad mm. for your health. And I've tried to find what is this five year thing based on? And mm -hmm. I can't find anything that justifies it. Mm -hmm. And even the idea of remission versus cure. We have a data here where we went to people in a breast, on a breast cancer awareness walk and to find out if they saw their breast cancer is in remission or cured. And let me take a step back and tell you where this all came from. I went to visit a friend of mine who had a very bad case of cancer. She had just come back from the hospital. And I said, so what did they tell you? And she said, they said her cancer's in remission. And just something went off, a light bulb. I said, wait a second. If I took the very same tests, presumably they'd tell me I don't have cancer. Why is it you have it, but it's not there, <laughs> you know, that it's in remission? And then they ask women to, um, to be stressed about this for five years. Now, if you have a cold and then the cold goes away, we don't say your cold is in remission. And if you get another cold, it's seen as a different cold, not the same cold that was hiding, right? And if cancer came back, it'd be a different cancer, the same in some ways and different in others, just like the cold. The mm -hmm. cold is similar, or else we wouldn't call it a cold, but it's also different. Mm -hmm. By paying attention to the ways it's different, we end up with less stress. Mm -hmm. So uh, for these women on this breast cancer awareness walk, we took all sorts of measures and we found that those who saw themselves as cured were better psychologically and physically on every measure we had taken. Hmm. Um, so I have a question for you as a physician, let's say that I'm have a diagnosis that I need to present to someone like they, there's obviously physical harm occurring because there needs to be some intervention to take care of. So example, a diabetic whose blood sugars are out of control, causing, you know, kidney issues and other things. So physically ill, how do you how do we move forward in, yes, we need to, this is an absolute because we need to treat, but also bring in that mindful component so that the patient can embrace the uncertainty. As, yeah, as well, I think the first thing, yeah. Yeah. I think the first thing, you know, physicians know they don't know. Right. And, you know, so I think they would be less stressed um, mm -hmm. if they put it all on the table in some sense and talked about, as far as we know, this is what seems to be the case. You know, you know your body uh, essentially better than anybody else so that we should partner in all of this rather than you turn yourself over to me. We should ask people for ways they might um, uh, help fix the problem and speak in terms of probabilities that we can't be sure, you know, that the liver, uh, the damage in the liver is caused by whatever you just said it was caused by, right? Mm -hmm. These are all best guesses. Um, 
And um, we need to provide people, I think, with choices. Okay. And you know, for the patients that are listening, I think what you need to do is ask the physician for choices, because in doing so, the physician will be more likely to make clear the limits to what we know, what they mm. know. Yeah, um, no, it's with any withholding any opportunity for yeah. patients to have empowerment yeah. is a malpractice, in my opinion, for my, sure. My, I agree, couldn't agree more. And I think yeah. also that, you know, uh, I, I can't believe there are still people who will be telling some people that they have six months to live. Mm. They're, they cannot know this. Now, you know, you can give ranges and so on. But um, for most people now, people seem to be uh, trying to add more years to their lives. And I think that instead, people should be adding more life to their years. Right. And that will probably increase the years to their lives. And um, yeah, anyway, you know, I think that if somebody, people, um, I, I speak to people who were given this kind of information from the medical world. And all I can say is that for me, if somebody told me that I had two months to live, I would really start living. <laughs> I don't think I would spend my time being angry, being depressed. Um, you know, the moments would be precious. And those mm -hmm. moments, I think, would be adding uh, to more. Yeah, there was interesting studies looking at physicians when they were given a quote unquote terminal diagnosis that many of them didn't take part in traditional care or interventions because they understood. Oh, exactly. Literally. So instead of, you know, causing more pain and probably <laughs> lessening that quality time that they did have left, they, they really made a, a different choice. So, uh -huh. so I'll have patients. So it's interesting that come to me because I'm considered an expert, so to speak, <laughs> expert in uncertainty, I guess at this point. Um, uh -huh. But when you have someone come to you and they're like, just tell me what to do. How do we start? Yeah. I almost feel like I'm sure. dealing with a child in the sense of like, okay, I, I can sure. tell you what to do, but I need you to understand this needs to be your decision and what to do. So I, I guess like, how, how do I even begin well, to change people's ability to encompass mindfulness? No, I, I think <laughs> that, yeah. You know, so remember we started before by saying prediction is an illusion. Mm. You can't predict. Right. Uh, and so that's what they're asking. And right. that's many physicians pretend that we know if you do this, this, and this, this will happen. And we just don't know that that's the case. Mm. Um, I think that, um, you know, you share all of this with the person, you know, we really don't know. Um, if it were I, maybe I da 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 da, da. you know, and so then that's, that's the course they may take. Um, that's but, interesting. You know, I mean, yeah, I think it, sometimes people do that so they can blame the person who is telling them, mm. here's what you should do. Um, and you can't know. Um, all you can do, as facile as it sounds, is make the moment matter. Mm. And then for as long as you're alive, it will all matter. There's no, you know, I, I think that physicians would do so much good in this world by sharing the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we have um, a study going on now where so somebody breaks their arm or whatever, they're having a surgery, whatever the, um, the problem is. And patients typically say, how long till I heal? And physicians often give the um, uh, normative response, you know, a modal response. So what we're doing now is telling people, so let's say you broke your leg and how long would it take for a broken leg to typically heal? You tell me. Do you uh, know? Goodness, fully, probably four to six weeks. Okay. So they say, and so instead of saying uh, four weeks, six weeks, we'd say, well, the person who's healed the quickest that I know of healed in two weeks. Now, mm. so, you know, I, I don't know how long it's going to take you. Mm. All right. So to change the expectation and those expectations really matter. Mm. So to go back to uh, some of the mind body unity studies, we did this study on wound healing. We inflict a wound, a minor wound, because you know, 
<laughs> Nobody's going to let us know what I want to really hurt people. And then they're in front of a rigged clock again. And the clock is going twice as fast, half as fast, or real time. And the wound heals based on your expectations, based on clock time. It's a rigged clock. So um, uh, I don't think we've come near appreciating how much control over we have over our physical our physical mm -hmm. health mm -hmm. you know we have um studies in the book about fatigue for instance now here's one where people think yeah you just get so tired and physically you can't go on so the first study we did here was very simple we just asked people do 100 jumping jacks and tell us when you're tired they get tired at around 70 on average then we have another group do 200 jumping jacks and tell us when you get tired. They get tired at 140. You know, so imagine the case where a person is word processing all day long and they're aching and their fingers hurt and then they go home and they play the piano. <laughs> that if you change the context, the whole game changes. And okay. There was a wonderful study that Frank Beach did back in the 50s. He takes a little boy rat introduces a little girl rat so they'll copulate and then the little boy rat can't take it anymore right too fatigued he needs a refractory period unless he introduces a new little girl there's new there's new there's new ground to call here yeah, you change the context and you know all of a sudden you have a renewed energy now you know i ask my students i say how long is it physically possible to run so they know a marathon is 26 miles so they know i wouldn't be asking the question if it was 26 miles so it becomes like an auction and somebody will say 30 somebody 35 then eventually someone will say 50 everybody will groan okay then i play um a video for them of a tribe in Copper Canyon in Mexico, the Tarayamora, that are able to run over 200 miles without mm -hmm. stopping. Mm -hmm. That's an enormous difference, yeah. right? Even mm -hmm. if we take the 50, I can't run, you know, haven't ever run a marathon. So for me, five miles would be exhausting. Mm -hmm. But uh, the difference between that 50 and 200, and I think metaphorically, that's the difference, minimal between what we think we can do and what we actually can do. Mm. And yeah, oh, yes. The Tatar Mara are amazing runners, but yeah. it's the same thing you could go to the fastest, right? So we were always told the human can never break a four minute mile. Well they oh, broke no, a four always, minute mile. always, yeah. It's yeah, amazing exactly. that you know, we can't, I don't know why we keep imposing limits. And right. if we keep breaking them, you would think somebody would say, well, maybe. <laughs> yeah, we haven't achieved the limit um yeah <clears throat> the point is that everything in our lives can be improved um the improvement starts by our recognizing that these limits are imposed by other people uh for one reason or another uh that we can't know that we can't and to go forward as if we can uh, makes everything worthwhile. So, um, you know, eventually you may find some limit, but uh, so far nobody has. You know, you, there are people who used to say when I was younger, was first studying aging, that you can't live past 80. And then you can't live past 90, you can't live past 100, whatever it is. So you give me a number and you say, you can't ha live past 122. But just think about it. If you can live to 122, don't you think you could live to 122 in a week? <laughs> you know? Exactly. Um, so yeah, it's very it's very exciting when we recognize that um, everything is mutable, that mm -hmm. everything can be changed and changed again to better meet whatever our current needs are. Mm. Yeah, I'd say there's two things, you know, as I know we're taking up your hour here, but just that I've seen that work really well with my own children. I have three grown kiddos now, but when they were little, they'd always say, if there's something came back to my request of something, he's like, I can't. I was like, well, I can't doesn't exist in this house. So tell me what you can do. That was one thing that I found really helpful. 
And then just really helping people yeah. understand that there is a different alternative to something. And it's almost like giving someone hope, right? Understanding that something you can uh, expand your thinking. Yeah. So pers- being a prescriber of hope and such, which I think is kind of what you are on a day to day, everyday basis. Yes, yes, <laughs> except that hope. So it's very hope. funny. Because, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I have negative feelings about it. <laughs> being hopeful is better than being feeling hopeless. Mm. But in the book, I go through over and over one thing after the other of, you know, a, there's a better way. Mm. And the culture, um, you know, professionals tend to teach you from this terrible to here's how to be here you know, better. But there's a whole other way of living one's life. And hope has built into it <clears throat> in part an expectation for failure. You know, you don't get up in the morning, go into the kitchen, hoping that you could have a cup of coffee. Mm. You sort of expect it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, so try, uh, mm-hmm. I was, we did these studies and I was told that it's, we should call it the Yoda studies, which I didn't realize because Yoda apparently said this good for Yoda. <laughs> you don't try, you do. Mm-hmm. And so trying again is better than not trying, but it's still better to just do. We have people trying different tasks versus doing the doing group outperforms the trying. We have so many things that are that are cockeyed and limited. Uh, I, I have I spend a lot of time thinking about language and describe lots in the book. Um, many, many years ago, and this is probably the last story I'll tell you. No, I love them. <laughs> but, um, I was asked to give a sermon at one of the Harvard uh, churches. Well, I'm Jewish and I'm not religious, and but I say yes to everything. So I said, yeah. And then I'm thinking, what can I talk about? And then I thought, well, forgiveness, it's not religion, but it sounds religious I could get away with that. So I start thinking about forgiveness and I end up with something, uh, Lori, sacrilegious. <laughs> So if you ask 10 people, is forgiveness good or bad? What are they going to tell you? Good. It's good. Um, if you ask 10 people, is blame good or bad? What are they going to tell you? It's Depends bad. The- no, it's bad. It's bad. bad. Okay, bad. <laughs> bad. But you can't forgive unless you first blame. So our forgivers oh. are our blamers. Now it gets even worse. Things in and of themselves are neither good nor bad. But you don't blame people for good things. You only blame people for bad things. So what does this mean? People who see the world negatively blame and then forgive. Hardly divine. Okay, so forgiving after you've blamed is better than not forgiving. But there's a whole other way that's so much better, which is understanding why the person did what they did. So don't blame me for being gullible, for example, to go back to where we were before. Understand that from my perspective, I was being trusting. Hmm. behavior makes sense from the actor's perspective or else they wouldn't do it. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, all right, maybe no, almost nobody and says, today I'm going to be mean, um, a bigot and uh, clumsy. (laughs) Okay. Mm -hmm. So when they behave this way, what was their intention? And when you're mindful, you're aware that looking at somebody to understand why they're doing what they're doing and being that somebody doing what they're doing may have very different explanations. And that when you know that things can be explained in multiple ways, you tend then to be much less judgmental. So you're not going to judge me negatively for being flexible and trusting, although you might judge me negatively for being gullible and inconsistent. Mm. Um, so question, a harder question, if we just elevate this, the, the consequences of someone's action a little bit. So someone's inducing physical harm or trauma, rape, murder, such as that. Sure. How, do we, how do we approach that? Because the, the blame yeah. is there was absolute serious consequences to their actions for sure, for sure. Like, how do we handle that? Yeah, I think that a lot of the legal system needs to be changed, but I'm not suggesting um, that uh, actions like rape, murder, you know, what have you, shouldn't have some consequence. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you are trying to redeem a person, uh, if you're trying to get somebody to change, the only way you're going to be successful is to know why, from their perspective, they did what they did. 
Mm. And, you know, as I said, that knowing that I'm gullible, um, trying to get me to stop being gullible is not going to work because that's not going forward what I'm doing. Mm. I'm being trusting. Right. And so, um, uh, uh, yeah, so, I mean, with rape. Um, and also, I think that when the victim, and, you know, in the case of rape, is aware of why the person who raped her did so in some odd way it's more empowering mm -hmm. you know that and when you even with bullying we don't have to go to you know to the extreme example as i've dealt with this with young kids and with women in industry mm -hmm. um, when somebody um abuses you emotionally that if you recognize that anybody who has it anybody who um you know uh I don't know, it was a mensch, but I don't know if your audience knows that word. Um, anybody who has it together uh, does not mistreat people. Mm -hmm. And knowing that, so when somebody, you think somebody is making you feel small, rather than feel small, I think you're better off feeling sorry for that person. Mm -hmm. Because nobody behaves that way out of choice, out of strength. Mm -hmm. And then by feeling sorry for the perpetrator, uh, you change the whole equation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I've uh, also been listening to Dr. James Pennebaker's recent work on expressive yeah. writing and really interesting ideas around taking different perspectives. And that helps someone kind of do yeah, right. Being, well, it, and it all like amounts that. to being mindful. Right. Exactly. That, you just being you know, mindful. Yeah, with all the that, emotions and stuff that's occurring. Yeah, so that if you if you bring up your kids to know that there are multiple ways of looking at anything, mm -hmm. um, they have all these choices going forward, and it's not you know. Um, and back in the day when we were developing cognitive behavior therapy, we would teach people to reframe things. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can constantly reframe the more mindful you are, the more potential frames. But if you start off mindful in the first place, there's no reframing, right? You know, that you just start off accepting the, the advantages of whatever it is in front of you. Mm. And all of that leads to a healthier, a healthier life. A healthier I, I think this is all I could continue asking you questions for many hours but I will be mindful of your time you dedicate to me today is there any final words you'd like to share is there a mantra that you live by or advice that you give constantly that you find people take an aha moment and can reflect upon and embrace well, no I, I hopefully have provided a few ahas yes there's lots um, of ahas of course it is. <laughs> yeah no I think that the important thing for people to realize is that um, mindfulness is easy, it's energy begetting, it's fun. Um, and so uh, now perhaps they'll become more aware that just showing up uh, essentially is going to help keep them healthy. And then play it forward. Um, you know, next time you hear you feel yourself being stressed, go through first ask is it a tragedy or an inconvenience go through some of the things that we've talked about recognizing events don't make you stress the view you take take a broader view uh, anytime you're unhappy recognize that you're limiting the way you're understanding the situation anytime you feel yourself being put down by anybody or you're casting aspersions, being judgmental, know that you're, um, uh, you're being mindless. And again, back to uh, the medical world, I think probably the most important thing for people to recognize is that nobody knows. Mm -hmm. And that all of our studies give us probabilities, not absolute facts. And we know our own bodies or can know our own bodies better than anyone. So at the very least, we should partner in um, our own health care rather than turn ourselves blindly over to anybody. Mm. Well, I think that's all fabulous. And I just in my own head thinking you could easily 
run, you said you run camps and groups of bringing physicians in and help them understand how to be a mindful physician, I think would be. Yeah, I would like that actually. (laughs) I have been thinking recently of um, what I might do, if anything, at Harvard Medical School to to help bring some of this about. No, I think that's- We'll see what happens. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you again, Dr. Linger, for joining us today. And everyone, please pick up. There's multiple books. There's art. There's so much that we didn't even start here to discuss. Let's start with The Mindful Body. The Mindful Body is the great start. So thank you for being here again. This was my pleasure. Thank you for having me here.